As that is all finishing up, again, a special welcome this morning. Uh, We're in the middle of our Colossians series where we're just taking some time to walk through the book of Colossians. Uh, And if you've been following along in the reading plan, uh, you'll see that uh, there's a bunch of stuff um, that's kind of been leading up and preparing ourselves for... uh, uh, for each message. If you have the YouVersion app on your phone, which is the Bible app on your phone, uh, each week there is a customized reading plan that we do that if you read through the week, it helps set you up for what we're going to be talking about on Sunday. Uh, with corn and apple happening this week, there's no official reading plan, but there still is information you can find if you, uh, if you open up your YouVersion app there. Uh, my children aren't at the age where uh, we have to worry about sharing our vehicle. Uh, Some of you might be at that age where, you know, driver's ed is barreling down on you this fall, and you realize that you might have a young driver in your family, uh, and that might be terrifying for you and for the general public. Uh, It might also be one of those things uh, that you're excited about, and especially if you are about ready to get your driver's license. Uh, I remember when I was getting my driver's license, Uh, I had to get it, um, actually I got it in Saskatchewan was where I was, and at the time it was just a piece of paper, like an actual piece of paper, it didn't even have a picture on it. You had to pay extra if you wanted a picture for your license. But one of the things that they taught you in driver's ed is that you always want to focus on where you're going so that that will help keep you there. That if your attention is drawn to the vehicle beside you, you find yourself drifting into that vehicle. Yes, we've experienced this before, where if you have a semi-truck, and I remember being on the highway for the first time, and you have a semi-truck that you're passing, and you don't want to speed because you have your driving instructor beside you, but you need to pass in a safe manner. Then you have this big vehicle beside you that you need to get around, and you look at it, and you look at it, and you just drift closer and closer. And they have to remind you, you know, don't look at the vehicle beside you, look at where you're going down the road, and that will help keep you straight and where you want to go. This is, this is kind of true in, in all sorts of different ways. It's kind of like if you're walking, and uh, for those of you at a different stage of life with your kids, uh, the kids, when they're younger, don't always look where they're walking, right? We have a hard time as adults wa- watching where we're walking, but little kids sometimes head down and full steam this way, yes? Yeah, they kind of like jart off into traffic or into people, and you have to stop them. And head, when the downside with keeping your head down when you're walking is that you're focusing on where your foot is landing, not where you're going. And if you're doing a small amount of walking or not very quickly, that's okay. But if you've ever tried to run while staring at your feet, it usually ends up for disaster because you're not looking at what's coming up down the road. It goes true with other things. I do a lot of cycling and on mountain biking, they always tell you, look further down the trail, look further down the trail where you want to go because if you're looking at the obstacles that are right in front of you, you will go towards the obstacles not around them. And your periphery vision has an amazing sense of being able to help you navigate where you want to go. As we dive into Colossians chapter 3 today, we'll see that this principle is also at work spiritually as well. So if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Colossians, the book of Colossians. It's a short book. I'll have the scripture on the screen as well. You can follow along. And we have the Apostle Paul who is writing, and he wants to kind of transmit the same kind of information, the spiritual Uh, Therefore, we've kind of done a whole bunch of different things in Colossians where he's making this argument that because Christ is so supreme and superior, therefore, we now don't have to live the way we used to. We have become changed and transformed. And Paul writes here, he says, since then, you have been raised with Christ. So since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And I think this is, it kind of makes sense. Uh, Now, Christians sometimes have had the reputation of like the phrase being so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. And where there's sometimes where we can set our minds on the things of heaven so much so that we aren't paying attention to anything that's around us. But Paul has made it very clear through the, the earlier part of his letter that our spiritual growth comes only from Christ. So therefore, it makes sense that we ought to have our focus on where the, the place where Christ is, the heavenly place where Christ is. It comes from the heavenly status that we now have, that we have been raised with Christ, and so we ought to focus on those things. But when we focus on those things, it it allows us to then keep our head up so we can see where we're going and not have to worry about the obstacles that we find ourselves 
around us. So he's saying, since this has happened, we need to focus on Christ. And he makes a transition. He keeps going here. Colossians uh, 3, next verse. Set your, um, for you, let's see. There you go. Set your minds on, on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So this is really important because when we focus on, it's, it's this tension that we have, right? So if we want to focus on where Christ is, we just have to also acknowledge that we have issues that are around us in the, in the earthly temporal world that are different than where Christ is in the heavenly world. And even in me saying that, kind of, it's a false dichotomy because it then makes it sound like Christ is far away and we are here and what we need to try and do is bridge the gap. Paul's using this language to allow us to kind of think that we need to set our minds on the things that have eternal values that help direct the things that we encounter around us. It is like the walking with our head down. If you only walk with your head down, you can only see the obstacles that are around you. When we walk with our head up, we're able to have our eyes seated, uh, focused on Christ and be able to move forward in a healthy way that actually impacts the things around us. And Christ was, Jesus had talked about this in Matthew chapter six. He had said this in Matthew chapter six. He said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Have our mind on the heavenly things. Seek first what God is doing. And then all these things, in the context, he's talking about all these worries that you have around you will be given to you as well. So you'll actually be able to focus on where Christ is and the other things that you're worried about, what to eat, what to wear, where you're going to find community, where you're going to get connection, how you're going to love your enemies, all that kind of stuff. If you focus on where Christ is, all the other things around you actually fall into place. But we can become so focused on exactly what's around us that we actually struggle with our spiritual walk and we can find ourselves spinning out and being consumed with worry and anxiety. Let's go back into Colossians. Verse 5. Oh, no, sorry, verse 4. Oh, 5, there it is. Yeah, put to death, therefore. Sorry. That's this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. So if we're focusing on God, we then have to put to death these things. And actually, these are the things that keep us stalled out. These are the things that keep us from focusing on what God has called us to. Paul has been making this whole case going, you don't need religion to be right with God. Christ has made you right with God on his act. You don't need to have these things. These things actually stop you from doing it. It actually gets in our way. It gets in the way of our heavenly mindsets. And there's a few things that are here that I think just jump out to us that this earthly nature, the sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and those ones are kind of all lumped together, but then he throws this last one in with greed, and he makes this weird connection. Greed is idolatry. This is a little bit different, because the other ones, you can go, okay, sexual immorality, impurity and lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. I think that idolatry is not just tied to greed, but it's tied to a lot of other things. And we can sometimes, in our secularized Western mindset, can think about idol worship as something so primitive. We don't, us enlightened folk, we don't actually worship idols. No, 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 we're, we're far too better than that. We, we don't think that these things made out of rock or made out of wood have any power over us. We don't, we don't actually do that kind of stuff. But I can't help but look at our culture's obsession with Porn, sex, the things that are driving our culture in those ways. And we can't, I can't help but think that that is a form of idol worship. Not just idol worship, but it's also spiritual. That we can't just look at it and say that's sinful, but Paul says that the fight that we have is not against flesh and blood, but it's against other things. It's against these princes and principalities. There's a spiritual element that is at play. And behind these insignificant rocks and things that we build, these idols are actually spiritual forces that we can give power to by being able to worship in that way. You look at the things in terms of our society's obsession with, um, uh, with commerce and greed and how cheaply we can have the nicest clothes, 
And we can think, oh, this slavery has actually, we've been able to eradicate slavery. But if you actually look at the stats, slavery is now more prolific today than it ever was. In fact, there are more people in slavery today than there was during the height of the slave trade. We've just changed it differently. We now own people by making sure that they make very little on the clothes that they sew for us overseas because we have been able to become obsessed with money and power and we begin to worship that in different ways and we give power to things that are spiritual behind these idols. And we can think that these spiritual things are silly. In fact, if you look in the book of Isaiah, I think that's the next slide we have here is going into the Isaiah passage. Isaiah 44. The prophet Isaiah is writing this big satirical, tongue-in-cheek thing about how silly idol worship is. And we can really easily fall trap into this. Isaiah 44, uh, starting at verse 12. And, and read this sarcastically. The blacksmith takes a tool and he works it over in the coals and he shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with the marker. He roughs it out with chisels and mar marks it with compasses. He shapes it in human form, human form in all of its glory that it may dwell in a shrine. He cuts down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or oak and he let it grow among the trees of the forest or he planted a pine and the rain made it grow. He used it for, as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and he warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread. But he also fashions a god from it and worships it. And he makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Uh, and, and the other half he prepares his meal. He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. See the fire? From the rest he makes a god, his idol. He bows down to it and worships, and he prays to it and says, save me, you are my God. They know nothing, they understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see and their minds are closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think, no one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of this I used for fuel. I even baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and I ate. Shall I still make it a testable thing from what is left? Shall I bow down to this block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads them. He cannot save himself or say, is this not the thing my right hand has made? A lie? Do you see the irony? He's saying the person who cuts down the tree, that the rain that God sent on the earth that grows the tree, he cuts the tree down, he builds a fire, he cooks over it, and out of the leftovers he makes a god and worships the god, thanking it for the tree that he had cut down. Like it, it, it's this satirical way of looking at it, and we can sometimes think that these idols are just so primitive. But if we're really honest with ourselves, it actually kind of hits close to home. Or maybe in our secularized society, we don't have these idols that we've created out of wood or, or stone that we would literally bow down and worship. But there are things in our heart that really draw us close that we cling to as idols. And we don't like going near them or having people talk about them because we get defensive about it. Uh, let's go to the next, next quote here. This is from a guy named um, David Foster Wallace. Uh, David Foster Wallace, kind of a brilliant man. This is a commencement speech he made in 2005 uh, that has been put into a book, uh, and it's called This is Water, Thoughts Delivered on a Significant Occasion About Living, uh, Living a Meaningful Life. And David Foster Wallace has this to say. You know, he is not a Christian. I, I, I can't render any judgment on his, on his beliefs because I don't know him well enough. But Christian would not be what he is. Spiritual, probably. Um, but this is what he has to say to a graduating class about how to live a meaningful life. And he says, In the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. Keep going. 
an outstanding reason for choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship, be it JC or Allah, be it Yahweh or the wicked mother goddess or the four noble truths, or some intangible set of ethical principles, is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. So he's making a case not to worship Jesus or worship God. He's saying, worship something bigger than yourself. He's not a Christian. I would say he has it wrong that you should worship Jesus, but he's saying, you're gonna worship something. Worship something bigger than yourselves. He says, if you worship money and things, if they are what tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel like you have enough. If you worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, then you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power and you will feel weak and afraid. And you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect, being seen as smart, and you will end up feeling stupid a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. Here is a person who in his wisdom says, worship at least something bigger than yourself, because everything else will eat you alive. Now, unfortunately for David Foster Wallace, shortly after that commencement speech, at much of the timeline, a couple months, he ended up taking his own life that whatever it was that he was worshiping, the things that were eating him alive, he found that that was the only escape. And uh, and ultimately, his wisdom perished in the middle of that too. But he was able to identify something. We all worship. You worship. If you're here and you're not a Christian, to say that you don't worship anything is a little bit foolish, because you worship something. We all have idols, and the way that you find out that you are close to an idol is that you get defensive whenever people talk about it. Don't touch my idol. It is precious to me. I was sitting last night with my wife, and I was trying to uh, flesh out some of these illustrations and trying to get a grip of it. Uh, And I had to come to the point where I had to actually identify the idols that I have in my life. Because it would be so hypocritical of me to get up here and tell you not to worship idols while I have these secret ones that I don't want to admit. And the things that I find that my heart longs for are power, um, achievement, and status. And even getting up here and saying that those are my idols is incredibly intimidating to me because in my mind, my biggest fear is people will be like, aha, I knew it. Stafford is power hungry and all he wants is influence and he wants to achieve everything. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. And that's my fear. And so I'm here bearing it going, these are the things that if I'm not careful, they consume me. And I think I'm in a, in a healthy spot where I'm not consumed by them. Jesus has been doing a work in my life that keeps me from being consumed by them. But left unchecked, they manifest in weird ways that keep me from focusing on the heavenly things of earth and keep me surrounded by the things that I want to keep together. And one of my idols is my bicycle. And I don't like saying that because I like my bike. It is precious to me. Don't touch it. (laughs) And there's nothing inherently wrong with bicycles. They're fantastic. They're great. They're great sources of exercise. Being on a bike rejuvenates your mind and your spirit and your physical body. These are fantastic things. But what an idol does is that an idol begins to make you think that if you don't have it, your life is not important. That if you don't have this thing, you are going to be missing out. And so idols make you do weird things. They make you spend money on it. They make you spend your time on it. They require sacrifices to it at the expense of your own well-being and your family and the people around you. And they become the thing that control you. And 
with much shame, I get up here and say, if I were to lose my bicycle, I would be hurt. It would hurt me. And so I could probably then say, well, you know what I should do? I'll just get rid of my bike. That's the easy thing. Just get rid of that thing. Get rid of the idol. Anyone want a good deal on a nice bike? I got one. The downside if I just do that is that if I don't actually address me and my heart, it will manifest in something else over and over and over again. If it's not my bike, it'll be my guitar. If it's not my guitar, it'll be, I don't know, something. It'll be my clothes. If it's not my clothes, it'll be manifesting in something if I don't actually address the source of the issue, which is my rotten heart. And if I don't focus on the heavenly places where Jesus is seated and allow him to do a work in my heart, these idols will consume me. They will eat me alive. And they'll eat you alive too. Want to know what your idol is? If you think you don't have an idol, just nudge your spouse, person that you know, and just ask them, what's your idol? Say, what's my idol? I'm not going to say, you don't have to do it right now. You could if you want. It would make it an interesting time. We can just kind of get rid of all the idols today. Just identify them. Uh, and, uh, and you don't want to do it. I asked my wife, I said, Joe, what's my idol? And she's like, your bike. I'm like, oh, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it that obvious? And it, it is that obvious because uh, my heart has not been right. It has, it has been consumed by it. It has been the source that I can have control over. If it's not that, it might be a person. If it's not that person, it might be something else that I can achieve and I can have some status. The bicycle's not the issue. Stafford's the issue. My heart is the issue. The things that are in this world are not the issue. They are good things that God has given to you for your enjoyment. When they become ultimate things that demand more from you, they will distract you. And we all have them. What does your heart lean for if it's not Christ? I know a way you can tell what your idol is. When you just have the opportunity to daydream, what do you think about? Want to know what your idol is? Go to your most um, frequented websites. You know what mine are? When you open up you know, Google, Google Chrome, you open up Google and it gives you your most, re- uh, uh, you know, your most clicked on websites. Two of them are sports websites. Four of them are mountain biking re- websites. Like, it's, just, it's so blatant, it stares me in the face. This is what, when I have nothing else to think about, I think about these things. It consumes me. Maybe it's a fifth wheel for you. Maybe it's a vacation property. Maybe it's sports of whatever your sport thing is. Maybe it's technology. Maybe you just you always go to the technology websites. Maybe it's clothes and fashion. Whatever it is that you find yourself drawn to. Maybe it's power tools. Maybe it's cars. Maybe it's whatever it is. And some of you are like, don't stop, stop talking. <laughs> because those are your things. The problem with idols is that they keep you from what God wants to do in your life. Uh, Scholar uh, N.T. Wright, Mr. Tom Wright, says this about idols. He says, When we humans commit idolatry, that is, worshiping that which is not God, as if it were, we thereby give to other creatures and beings in this cosmos a power, a prestige and authority over us, which we, under God, were supposed to have over them. Okay, you have been raised with Christ. You have been seated at the heavenlies because he has gone first. In his death, you died. In his resurrection, you were raised. In his seating in righteousness, so were you. He is making you to be more like him and you have a power over these things that is by what Christ has done rightfully yours. But when you worship an idol, whatever it is, you abdicate something of your own proper human authority over the world and give it instead to that thing whatever it is. So how do we fix this? If we're supposed to have power over this, if we're supposed to be focused on the heavenly places where Christ is seated, and that's supposed to direct where we're going, how do we fix this thing? Well, ultimately it's Jesus, but there's something else that's, there's something that we get to do as well. So I have a couple points. If you're a note-taking person, you can take these down. I think a sermon's supposed to have three points. I have four. It's an extra one. This is like an added bonus. Community. I think community is going to be the key to keep you from being consumed by your idols. Because community pulls you out of self-centeredness. Do you know what idol worship is? It's just selfishness. 
you know why I struggle with the things that my heart goes to? It's because I'm selfish. I am a selfish human being, and I have to rid myself of that, and the antidote for being selfish is community. Idolatry is always selfish. So community will pull you to your self-centeredness. Next thing, community, it calls you higher. When you're in community, you just go further. You go further and farther than you ever thought you ever could. There's something intangible about doing, doing things in community. I see it on my bike. You go for a bike ride, and things I would tap out with, you know, I just can't keep going any further. You put one person behind you or beside you or in front of you, and that extra person pulls you along further than you ever could. Same thing goes when you're encountering hard things in life and you need someone around you. Community calls you higher. You will go further in your faith if you are in community. This is just the way it is. It'll call you higher. Uh, it calls you higher. The next thing. It holds you accountable. Community will hold you accountable to your idols or to the dis- destruction of your idols. Now, it could be that some of you aren't in community, you're not in a life group, simply for the fact that you don't want to be held accountable. You just need to at least admit that part. Like, I don't want to be in community because someone's going to call me out on my lifestyle and how I spend my money and my time and the things that I worship and the, the growing gap between what I profess and how I live. I don't want to be called out on that, so I just won't enter into community. If that's the case, at least admit it. And some of you have structured your life groups in a way where it's just, it's just everything is off limits. You can't talk about the things that are actually messing with your heart because you don't want to be held accountable to it. But if you enter into community and you allow yourself to be held accountable, it'll pull you out of your self-centeredness, it'll call you higher, and it'll help hold you accountable. It'll hold you accountable to the faith that you profess. And the last thing is, it makes you more like Jesus. Community makes you more like Jesus. See, God, in his essence, is not lacking anything. And in his essence, we profess that he is three in one. Three distinct. He is Father, Son, and Spirit, and together they are one, but also individually they are God. They are both, they are three individual persons that make up one God, and they lack nothing because in his essence, he is love, but you can't love unless you have an other to love. And the essence of God is that he is loving and in community together in himself. It doesn't make sense. This is what we believe in faith. But when you are in community, you become more like Jesus. Jesus needed community. What we don't see in scripture is Jesus just going through and doing everything by himself. No, he had had circles of community. He had the three. Peter, James, and John. Bartholomew never got invited up the mountain. He was the disciple we don't talk about much. Everyone, you know, they have the 12. And then from the 12, he has the 70. And then he has the multitudes. Jesus was in community in his ministry. He needed it for himself. When things were tough, he took his friends because he needed them. And he was fully God and fully human. And he needed community. So do you. And in community, you'll be able to have service. You'll be able to care for each other. One of the things we're doing with our life groups in the fall is we're putting more, fire, more gas on the fire so that our life groups become places where this actually takes place. Where when things go sideways in your life, you have a community around you that is willing to lay down their preferences to build you up and to meet you there. When things are great, you can celebrate there. You can serve each other and you can actually have true love for each other because you are able to care for each other in these ways. We want our life groups, the reason why we're investing a bunch of energy into our life groups this fall and into groups in general is because we know that community will help keep us focused on Jesus. You still have to do the hard work of identifying where your heart is rotten and then focus on Jesus and allow him to do a transformative work in you. But community is going to be the antidote for you to help move further. In the next little bit, Pastor Henry is going to be communicating how you can get into life groups. There'll be life group leader training. There'll be a bunch of stuff that we're going to be focusing on with life groups. And I just encourage you, enter into that. Don't skirt community. It'll make you more like Jesus. It'll transform you there. Let me call the worship team up. Uh, we have a chance really to respond where we can say, I don't want my life to look like this. I actually want to be focused on Jesus. I want to build my life on Jesus, not on the things that my just really messy heart 
longs for. In fact, I will eschew those things so that I can focus on him, the only one who gives me life. Let's stand and sing with the team. Uh, There's going to be a prayer team that's available up here. And uh, the insidious thing about idols is that they always convince you that they're not there. They convince you that there's nothing, you you don't have to do anything. But if you're anything like me, when you begin to actually look at your heart, you just find yourself just disgusted with what can actually be lurking in there. And the idol will convince you that, hey, it's no problem. Everyone does this. I just encourage you to deal with this stuff. Deal with it. If you don't deal with it, it will eat you alive and it will jeopardize the calling that Christ has put on your life to impact the world where you are. The prayer team is prepared to be able to pray with you for anything that you need. Enter community, confess your sin to each other, and in doing so, you will be healed. Let's be a church that is seeking after Jesus in that way. May you go with the peace of God, knowing that he is with you and he has forgiven you for everything and he has positioned you exactly where you are for his glory. Let's focus our attention on where he is, not on the things around us, and we'll get to live into that reality. Go in peace. We'll see you next week at Corn and Apple, not here. And then we conclude Colossians in September.